Hi again. By the middle of the 1800s in the United States, cotton was king. In the 1850s, cotton was America's most valuable export by far. Unfortunately, it's hard to deal with the history of American cotton without dealing with the legacy of American slavery. Today, what I'm gonna try to do is reconstruct some parts of life from a typical cotton plantation. What you're looking at here is something called American short staple cotton. This was the most commonly grown type of cotton grown in the American South in the 1800s. Cotton is a plant that grows about, about three and a half feet tall. And at the top of the cotton plant is this. And this is called the cotton bowl. And this is, it's kind of like the bloom or the blossom of the cotton plant. And it's got these petals which have to be peeled back and they're very tough and they're kind of sharp on the outside. And you have to extract the cotton from inside the cotton bowl. And you have to do that many, many times over, hundreds, thousands of times a day to get you know, a worthwhile amount of cotton. And what you get then is this. And this is raw cotton. So this is you know, a whole bunch of cotton bowls that you have extracted the cotton from. But you see that it's still got a, a lot of leaf material, plant matter, sticks, twigs, things like that, that are still in there. And also, there's a lot of these big lumps in here. And those are the cotton seeds. And those have to get extracted. And all this has to be clean before the cotton can be processed. And one of the things that you're trying to get out of the cotton is this. These are the cotton seeds. And you need them, number one, you need them for next year's cotton crop. But these also have to be extracted from the cotton before it can be spun, before it can be you know, put it through a spinning wheel, before it can be made into thread, and certainly before it can be sold to a textile factory or shipped out. And this was very hard work to separate the cotton seed from the cotton lint. It was done by hand. It was done originally by just taking a couple of bristle brushes and maybe some steel brushes and just trying to get the, the cotton fluff away from all the plant material. What really changed everything was when um, a man named Eli Whitney made an improvement to an old invention and created something called the cotton gin. So here you see a basic diagram of Eli Whitney's cotton gin. Now Whitney was not the original inventor of the cotton gin. Other people had invented versions of it before him. He just kind of makes some improvements and it becomes the most popular type of cotton gin used in America in the 1800s. So you see you take the raw cotton from the plant and you put it into one side of the machine. And the machine is just kind of a simple system of a couple belts and pulleys and a couple bristle brushes and you turn it with a crank handle so this can be operated by one person you turn the crank the cotton is put through these series of bristles and brushes and the seeds are extracted and they fall out that you can collect them and use them in the future and when the cotton fluff goes through the machine at the right side it comes out as this pure cotton lint which has all the impurities, the seeds, the twigs, the plant matter all taken out and now it's ready to be spun or to be sent to a textile mill. And this made the entire process of processing cotton much faster, much more efficient. Unfortunately, it made slave labor much more popular and more in demand as cotton planters thought they could now make far more money by planting cotton. So what you see here is kind of a sample layout of a typical Southern American cotton plantation. I don't know if this is based on any one in particular, but it's kind of got the structure that a typical plantation would have. It's important to remember that a plantation, a cotton plantation, is not simply growing cotton. It's, it's also a large scale farm. So it's got farming operations on it as well as just the planting and processing of cotton. So starting with the most you know, simple and obvious thing, here you've got you know, the plantation house, sometimes called the big house. This is where uh, 
you know, the owner of the plantation, the planter, um, the slave owner, this is where he lives and his family. It's obviously the biggest, most impressive structure on the plantation. And he's doing that to show off his wealth. He's doing it to impress. He wants to impress his neighbors, his friends, his fellow cotton planters, um, just about you know his wealth, and the amount of property, and the amount of um, cachet and you know dignity that he has. So he's going to want you know a big ornate home. It's also in a smaller way meant to maybe impress uh, his enslaved workforce, right? That if you know if he lives here, he must be a man of some importance, and so forth. Um, again, you see all over, you see fields, right? So a plantation was also a farm. So they're, of course, they're, they're growing food crops for all the people on the plantation. They're also growing a certain amount of crops to feed to animals, uh, whether it's their, you know, their draft animals like horses or whether it's cows, pigs, chickens. So there's regular farming operations besides just the planting of cotton. Um, you see that several fields would be this, you know, kind of big white field here and one here. So there are cotton fields all over. Um, and of course, they would demand a lot of the work of the enslaved workforce, but the enslaved workforce would also work in all the other fields, growing grain or growing vegetables or growing crops for the entire operation. Uh, there'd be many, many buildings on plantation or on a farm. You've obviously got a stable to keep all the animals, um, a smokehouse for the preserving of meat, uh, a barn could be like a hay barn, um, a warehouse. This is where once cotton was harvested and it's waiting to be processed or after it has been processed, it can be stored in the warehouse waiting to be shipped away. Um, here is one of the most important things on the plantation the cotton ginning shed. So a plantation might have several cotton gins and cotton ginning sheds, and a lot of times they would be put inside, um, to, it says to protect them from the weather. Um, also, they, the cotton gin itself was a pretty valuable thing, and the plantation owner, or certainly the overseer, they would want to keep an eye on the cotton gin, because if the cotton gin broke down or uh, was sabotaged, you know, that maybe that might be a way for the enslaved workforce to try to like fight back a little bit and maybe like sabotage the equipment so they wouldn't have to work. So they would keep a, a pretty close eye on this. Um, some places that I want to point out, here you've got next to the main house, next to the plantation house, it says the overseer's house. So the person that was most in commonly in touch with the enslaved workforce was actually not the plantation owner. Um, a lot of times he might be off the plantation doing business or traveling or things like that. The person that they're going to see on a day-to-day -day basis is someone called the overseer. And he is, he gives the enslaved workforce their daily tasks, their jobs. He's in charge of making sure that they are working. He's in charge of, you know, dishing out punishment if any of the slaves are misbehaving or if they run off. Um, oftentimes this might be you know, a white man who was employed to watch uh, the plantation in place of the plantation owner. Sometimes it was a former slave and they might take that job because it was a paying job. And maybe as a former slave, they thought they may be able to like, you know, watch after, you know, the slave population a little bit more closely. But typically these are the people, this is the person whom the slaves have the most contact with. And as a result, this was the person that, especially if this was not a very kind person or a harsh uh, overseer, this person got more of the anger and the bitterness from the enslaved workforce than the plantation owner. He's kind of distant, the plantation owner is kind of distant. They see the overseer every single day and he is usually a lot of the focus of their bitterness and anger and hatred. And then of course, out here, you have the slave cabins. And the slave cabins would not have been you know, very fancy structures. They're a lot of times just crude wooden structures. They don't have a floor, they have a dirt floor. They're small, um, they're not well ventilated, they're not well heated. And usually they would not, you didn't want them, the plantation owner would not have wanted them too close to the main house 
because he thought it would like you know take away from the grandeur of his establishment. But you also didn't want to put the slave cabins too far away. You wouldn't put them miles and miles from the house because then your enslaved people would be harder to watch and harder to monitor. It might be easier for them to escape or it might be more tempting for them to escape. So this is kind of the basic structure of what a cotton plantation would have looked like. So what you're looking at here is maybe a typical daily schedule uh, for enslaved workers on southern plantations, cotton plantations. A couple things though, it is important to remember that uh, life on any farm and life on a plantation is seasonal. So that means depending on what time of year it is, the work schedule is going to be different. Like there's just less work to do in the winter time and not as much you know, time is spent out in the fields. It's mostly doing other tasks. So at certain times of year, the day might be longer or shorter based on the amount of work that there is to do. And another thing to remember is that when you're looking at a, a typical schedule like this, it's basically six days a week. And usually Sundays, or sometimes called the Sabbath, is a time that the enslaved workers would have off to be just with their families or you know, with the other people in their community or at home doing just household chores around their cabins. Most enslaved families would have their own little garden that they would tend animals to take care of. Sundays were also set aside for you know, worship services and you know, church services and prayer services and also recreation, playing games, playing music, just trying to you know, have a little bit of family time with their family. But then this might be a typical work schedule. And one thing that you can see is that it's a very, very long day. Um, up at first light and working until there's no light. So really from first light to last light. And again, depending on the time of year, if there's more daylight, the day can go longer. If there was a full moon and you could see, you know, at least for a couple hours in the night, it might even continue after dark. So you can see here it says 3 a.m., probably around 3 a.m., out of bed, tend to the animals. So that might be their own animals. Like maybe they might have some chickens around, you know, uh, their cabins, or they're tending the animals on the larger plantation, feeding the chickens, maybe the pigs, walking the horses, making sure they have water and things like that. Maybe some time for daily prayers, you know, a breakfast, a breakfast type meal. Maybe around seven, start work. So this is the time when um, the overseer might give them the day's tasks or give them the day's work and they would go out into the fields. And the people that would go out into the fields typically um, were the adults, especially the adult males and children pretty much anywhere from maybe nine to 10, they were considered old enough to go out and work in the fields. And they might work for maybe five hours or so. Um, around midday, they would have lunch. Now, they would have called that dinner. We refer to it as lunch in our times. And they would have had a little bit of time off and maybe around one o'clock back to work for many, many more hours, maybe until around seven. So maybe another six hours of work, um, stop again for another meal, supper or dinner. And then even after that, they might return to work, especially in the summer when it's still light, they would return to work for a third shift until it's really too dark to see or too dark to work. Um, and then by the time it's dark, they're back to their homes, they're back to their cabins, they're absolutely exhausted. They've worked at least 12 or maybe 15 hours that day. And so there's not a lot of time really for anything else. Typically, the overseers and the owners of the plantations, they wanted it that way. They didn't want their enslaved workers to have a lot of idle time, a lot of free time, keep them busy. If they're busy, they're working. After they're working, they're tired. And of course, the other thing is not only are you trying to maximize the profits that you're getting from these enslaved people, you're denying them time to maybe escape or plan an escape or think about it or learn about the outside world. You're not, of course, giving them any time to read. Um, of course, most slaves were not allowed to read, learn how to read and write. You wouldn't want them having too much contact with the outside world. So. The, the busier you could keep them, the more occupied, and then at the end of the day, just the most exhausted that you could keep them was, was better 
That was what was considered the optimal daily schedule for your enslaved workforce. Cotton may have brought great wealth to some, but the system of slavery that went with it brought pain, suffering, and oppression to millions of others. The legacy of American cotton cannot be separated from the legacy of American plantation slavery. And that is a legacy which is a stain on our country's history that we still are dealing with in the 21st century. Thank you for joining me, and until next time, be well.